So, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to Tashkil Lecture Series. Tashkil hosts monthly online lectures on specialized topics by industry experts who share their personal experience and knowledge. These lectures are designed to give artists and designers critical tools to further their professional development and careers. Today, we are lucky to have Jana Trabulsi with us. Jana is a visual artist, graphic designer, and educator. She is the co-founder and creative director of Pan Arab Quarterly Bidayat and the artistic director of Snoobar Beirut Publishing House. In 2014, she has co-founded Sigil, an art collective based in Beirut and New York. In addition to being commissioned uh, to commissioned and collective projects, her work explores creative methods of research and the relation text image as a place for critical thought and commentary, often bringing between the personal and the socio-political. Since 2004, she teaches design and illustration, studios and lectures in history and theory. She has recently joined Isab Marrakesh as the Pedagogical Director of the Graphic and Digital Design Department. Jana's uh, lecture today is titled Critical Design. Um, some, just a few housekeeping points. Uh, please mute your microphone during the presentation. Feel free to ask questions in the Q&A session, which uh, hopefully we will have after Jana's presentation. You can either ask directly by raising your hand or you can send it as a written question in the chat box. Uh, welcome Jana and the floor is yours. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much Hiba and thank you Tashkil for this opportunity. Um, so, I will try to, um, I made the selection of some of my projects and I'll address in this talk a few questions that have been the, the key questions across my practice. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll talk about my practice as a designer mainly, but also as an artist and an educator. I hope these questions that I've been struggling with and working on uh, echo the concerns of others attending here. I look mainly at the tension between three things, form, content, and context. For the purpose of this talk today, I decided to use a shortcut. Uh, it's one of these expressions that we, that we commonly uh, use, the idea of the imposter syndrome. So I had all of these doubts. I felt like an imposter in the field of graphic design in so many ways and at very different instances until eventually these doubts moved or revealed to be critical questions towards the field as opposed to self doubts about my position as a designer. Uh, questions that, that, you know, that challenge the, the function of graphic design in society that question the boundaries between design and other fields, uh, what kind of dominant visual languages are used in graphic design. Basically, <clears throat> I would structure the talk based on three main questions. One is the relation between art and design and between different roles, the role of the author and the role of the service provider to keep on using some shortcuts, but I'll develop uh, as we go. The second is about uh, the politics of design and design within political context. And the third is about the cultural provenance of, of images. Where do they come from? Um, what language do they speak? Next, please. Um, so first, I'm someone who wanted to be an artist. I entered graphic design because I like to draw and um, I kind of was advised to study design and not art because at the time it was a more lucrative field, uh, specifically for my mother who would think of my independence as a woman. And so this is what I did. And I struggled because I, ha I had uh, artistic desires that I couldn't find their place in the field of graphic design. So this was one of my key questions along the way how to reconcile my artistic and critical aspirations with the commercial requirements of the design field. And through projects I worked on, 
that I will talk about today, I will reflect at this possibility, how to be an author in the visual productions that are, uh, how to be an author, how to also, sorry, put meaning and craft into the visual productions that we, that we disseminate, even within the very practical function of communicating content that is not always our own content. So this is the, the, the famous service provider author dichotomy and that I also lump with the design art dichotomy. The quote I chose here is of um, the Milanese designer Munari. He actually talks about um, the way artists move into becoming designer by designers by by how design allowed artists to actually reach a white public and in my work it's also um, back and forth it's also being a designer and bridging back into artistic practice uh, next <clears throat> my second question um, has to do with the, the politics of the field. So it was a dilemma, a very a difficult dilemma to be uh, working as a designer specifically when I started practicing design where, where a lot of the dominant function of the, or at least a lot of the design work was advertising work, which is not, not only the case today. Um, I had difficulty finding what kind of contribution I was doing to society. Um, so what contribution that is useful, that is not just serving market demands, uh, contribution that is aligned with one's own politics. And because graphic design has been put mainly at the service of the market and, and developed strategies to uh, manufacture glamour, as John Berger says, it rec he also says it recognizes nothing except the power to acquire within the culture of capitalism. And I've had a big dilemma with um, my own values and politics and contributing to this field. Also mainly finding different ways to communicate if it is not for market demands. So this has been quite a struggle and I will look or reflect with you uh, at how I try to do this and, and you know, successes and failures. Um, next, the last question, uh, sorry, no, back. I forgot to talk about this uh, quote. So this is a quote from uh, Paris Clavel, who is a French designer. And he was one of the key figures of the May 68 movement uh, in Paris. And he talks about a very interesting aspect, which is the idea that images have no, no political power as long as they are just uh, still, but they need to be carried. And by carried, the image that I see is us carrying images marching on the street, as opposed to throwing monologues on billboards to people who cannot answer them. And his work is uh, the work of a collective called Ne Pas Plier, Do Not Bend, including uh, sociologists and, and uh, graphic designers and artists and working with a lot of workers' movements where they together um, produce images that, that participate to the causes they believe in and work for. Okay, so, uh, and one, one more thing I wanted to add about this point is that uh, my dilemma here has not been only to work for the market or for political causes, but it was also how, how to develop strategies that uh, honor different kinds of human qualities or human needs or human faculties than the one of consuming and acquiring, et cetera. How do we do this as graphic designers? How do we create different relations among members of societies or, um, uh, or, or how do we as communicators create different relations with uh, our audiences? And Gérard Paris Clavel has been a very inspiring figure um, in this regard. Okay, next. 
So my last question has to do with the cultural color of the images I have been uh, producing. So the education I received and my practice and the education I have and what I have been teaching as well for a long time um, didn't question in any way the, the origin of the visual culture that we had, that we were inspired by. And it seemed as if the aesthetics, the, the design rules and the norms were um, absolute truth and that they didn't have a historical or, or a geographic context. And it took me a while to question this. And it has been a very difficult quest to find ways to create visuals or communication material that has a form of um, cultural belonging without falling into stereotypes and cliches, etc. And here I, I use an interesting um, quote from Etel Adnan, who, um, who died recently, who used to write mainly in French and had a big ethical dilemma about writing in the French language in the middle of the Algerian war that she solved one day as a revelation when she started painting. And she said, since I could not, since I could only write in French, I will at least paint in Arabic. And I think it's some kind of similar statement that I've, uh, I've tried to achieve. Okay, so, um, so I look at, I will look now at the few projects I, I worked on looking at these three questions. Uh, most of the projects are in the cultural field. Some are self-initiated, some are more, um, some are commissioned, some are um, with an artistic and not design work because, you know, because these boundaries exist. Uh, and I will discuss these questions across these works. Next. So the first work I decided to present is the worst design I've ever done. Um, I was living in Peru at the time and I was commissioned to uh, design the cover of a, um, a congress um, of a publication that was the result of a seminar on indigenous people in isolation, which are basically indigenous people who uh, do not have contact with us and contemporary society today. And the reason why I talk about this design that I find horrific is how much it revealed to me a problematic relation I had with representation and I had with design. The first attempt on the left is some form of stereotypical face of what an indigenous person could look like, in my opinion, maybe without gender and with the jungle around. The second one is a bit of a better option on the right, where I try to show the habitat to escape the stereotypical face of this is what they look like. And this um, embarrassing example <laughs> was a very good lesson to me because uh, the solution I found in the next slide, next please, is actually was actually through drawing. So um, what I drew here is some kind of abstract symbolic representation of the jungle. And among all the leaves, one of them is an eye. And this eye could represent either being an indigenous person uh, protected by the wall that is the jungle because of wanting to be isolated from contemporary society, or it could be the eye of the anthropologists participating in this Congress and scrutinizing these um, uh, indigenous population. And what this, this drawing allowed me to do is actually to have a say in a commissioned work. Instead of answering you know, a command, we just need a nice cover or we just need a cover that describes the subject, I was able to comment on the subject. There was some kind of absurdity about a whole Congress of people talking about populations that were absent. And this kind of commentary 
being explicit or not, I was still able to pass it through uh, this drawing. Also, I was able to escape the idea of uh, of a stereotypical, um, you know, representation of of indigenous people. And so, <clears throat> sorry. And so, this example for, sorry. So, this example was a kind of um, revelation to me of what drawing, how I could bridge back my interest for drawing and graphic design. Next. So this is the final cover, which design is not particularly interesting, but just was a was a was a good solution, a very revealing solution to the problematic I had um, before. Okay, next, please. Another example I'm showing. So these are very old projects, and I was a starting designer, and um, they are a bit of anecdotes. I will reach more you know, complete projects later, but this was a um, commission poster to promote a font. And there was the development of um, a series of Arabic fonts based on Latin fonts. This was the typographic matchmaking project led by Hoda Abi Faris. A few designers were asked to do promotional posters for the new Arabic fonts that were designed. And these Arabic fonts were a breakthrough because we've had us designers working in the region and in Arabic language, we had very few good fonts and these were finally readable, you know, good looking typefaces. So I designed the poster to promote this typeface, but I had a commentary about the process, which was a form of critique while promoting this great initiative, a critique on the idea that Arabic fonts would be based on Latin typefaces. Why would, you know, why would we use um, uh, the typeface of French or English as the base for Arabic typography? And the way I formulated this commentary is to write a text, which is a list of words in Arabic. I used, you know, um, Lebanese dialect that actually come from uh, English or French. So the content of the text is, you know, doesn't totally match the, the, the language, but the font actually links them because it is Latin looking, but, you know, with Arabic letters. So it was a way to both promote and comment on, on this process. Okay, next. So um, in, this, in this critical question that I'm discussing first in relation to, to uh, finding a place for authorship and commissioned work and finding a place for um, artistic work, this is also one of my early projects. Uh, this is a brand identity for ASABIL, um, Lebanese Association for Public Libraries. I'm also a member of the association. I started this project when I was still a student and across the years it evolved. Um, so this was basically my first commission. The logo is a kind of house, of house, a book within a house where the, the book works almost like a door to the house. And then the book is used as a basic unit to a whole world of poetic imagery from uh, the book as a bird, the book as a flower, etc. And the reason why I'm showing this example is also the way the illustrate, so the, um, sorry, the raw material of uh, my work as a designer, the fact that I could produce imagery, that I could draw them, that I could, um, I don't only art direct um, other people to produce the imagery, but I would, produce it myself allowed me to have a very large input in the design work that I would do and my involvement apart from the fact that I could be a member and be interested in the field but my involvement is one that I had called until now authorship right where you know these are visuals that are um, that do not only solve a communication problem but actually um, 
where I bring in a particular voice. Next, please. So these, the first image was a stationary. The second is very, very old design of mine, a poster for the one of the three public libraries in Beirut that open in a garden. So here, the garden idea is illustrated by this bird with shadow uh, is a book. Next, please. Also, this was a very, um, you know, low budget project where we did across the years, a few flyers that were uh, photocopied. And um, I decided to, to actually adopt or own the aesthetic of the photocopy. So you can see the gutter of the book, you can see the hand as if, you know, as if it's a, it's a mistake, you know, so to, to also um, um, take in the aesthetics of photocopying books that comes with the whole uh, practice of, uh, of um, library. Next. And last is a manual for uh, librarians where uh, the imagery are, um, are illustrated collages that talk about different aspects of um, activities in the library. Sorry, I think that's all for us. Yeah, okay, next. So um, <clears throat> this bridge between illustration and design, who on one hand allowed me to solve a problematic of uh, having things to say and trying to find a place for them within uh, the design field. It started actually when I was commissioned for illustration work as a graphic designer and the first um, uh, practice I had was drawing for the newspaper for Safir in 2005. Uh, and it was a very interesting uh, experience because the newspaper is filled with uh, documentary photography and facts. And suddenly I had a space for personal stories and drawing. And I found that this contrast was a very interesting way to bridge the intimate with the, the sociopolitical and, the, and larger issues that were, um, that had um, that impact on our personal lives. So this was also my first drawing for Safir. It makes, it tells an anecdote about um, our whole generation who could recognize the sound of the different bombs who would fall on Beirut during the war the way other people like bird watchers could recognize different species of birds from their, from their songs. Okay, next, yes. Uh, this one is a commentary on our electricity problem in Lebanon and it uses a, an expression uh, that we constantly use when electricity cuts, where does it go? And this is a commentary on the idea that it is stolen, that a lot of the electricity is actually uh, stolen. Next. In 2011, I had a, um, a little health issue that uh, affected, uh, I mean, that um, was linked to some hemorrhage and bleeding. And it was at this exact moment that people took the streets across the Arab world. And this one was for um, Egypt on the 25th of January. So this is a very, a small link between the map of the Nile the River and my own uh, veins through the raised uh, fist. Next. It was also published in a um, Italian uh, newspaper. Next. In 2014, this one was a, um, a commentary on one more attack on Gaza by uh, describing it as a genocide uh, in uh, Tolls, I think, I don't know how we say it, uh, um, uh, in parts, if you want. Uh, this was published in the French newspaper, L'Humanité. 
next. Uh, this double drawing um, is uh, was done due for um, for women for International Women's Day in 2010, and it tries to make two different comments. Um, it's it's a general commentary on the kafala system and um, the employment of maids uh, in Lebanese households that actually. Uh, take over a lot of the tasks of um, Lebanese women in general. So the one on the right is um, uh, the domestic worker actually demanding the rights of her employer. Um, and the one on the left talks about women liberation and it's a commentary on um, my whole generation and and a lot of the women around me whose uh, capacity to work and be fulfilled professionally and in other forms of their lives so their 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 um, uh, liberation is only in this case lebanese so and is at the cost of the enslavement or at least the exploitation of other women's work. And I, what I wanted to add about the reason why I'm showing also all of these images is that it is, um, it is obviously pure illustration work, you know, in a newspaper, but it's also, um, for me, it has always been because I'm a designer and an illustrator where the relation between text and image, which are the key raw material through which we work as designer, is also essential for my illustration work. So, so what does the image say in relation to what does the text say? The one on the left, typically, you know, you cannot read the image without the text or the text without the image. They, the, this, the text is almost a caption that changes totally the meaning of the image. And this is part of the way my background as a designer also allowed me to, to, uh, to, to author the content, the text content when I was doing illustration work. Okay, next. This is for the commemoration of the Lebanese Civil War, and it's a play on words between uh, Nissan uh, April, 13th of April, and Nissan uh, Amnesia. It's a commentary on our amnesia about, about this past. <laughs> Next. This is a quote from uh, Rashid al which meaning I subverted with the illustration. It says the, the only bad thing about writing on the walls is that walls or pages one cannot turn, which one would imagine is um, a commentary on graffitis and tagging on the wall. And I subverted it with an illustration of, of bullet holes. Uh, also, this was also, uh, I think, at the moment of the, the Lebanese Civil War commemoration. So. Next. This drawing is a commentary on uh, the construction boom that happened and was still happening until recently in Beirut. Uh, the caption reads, because they, want, they all want a view on the sea, we cannot see the sky anymore. And, um, and this image started as a drawing for a, a, a magazine. Next, please. It was then uh, also um, printed as a sticker. And then um, some people made a stencil of it and it was um, uh, sprayed uh, onto the walls in Beirut. And it was for me a very interesting moment where until then, all of these commentaries were things draw alone in my room, and then they would have a life on their own through the newspaper. And I was very thankful about the fact that um, 
if I'm looking back at the art design dichotomy, that I could draw something that suddenly would have thousands of um, owners at very affordable price. And it took a whole other dimension for me when suddenly um, my um, the fact that my tools as a graphic designer were those of mass produced items allowed me to create stickers that I would stick on the construction uh, site walls and that then other people took this imagery and sprayed, sprayed this uh, visual on the walls, etc. So this project and the one I will talk about right after were a bridge for me to move from a personal space to actually uh, to the streets. Next, please. <coughs> so in 2014, <clears throat> there has been a very big wave of demonstrations in Beirut from uh, the um, daily workers in mainly public education. And one of them, Ali Bejo, was a um, chemistry teacher. He started a hunger strike in front of the Lebanese parliament. And at this moment, I contacted the newspaper where I was drawing uh, weekly and demanded to publish a drawing every day in um, in solidarity and encouragement for his um, strike. Um, so this is one of the images. And the second one, next please, is him with the newspaper. So finally, I he was receiving the copies, of course. Uh, and then one day I took one of the issue and I went to visit him um, uh, on the site of his, um, of his strike. And again, it was a key moment where suddenly uh, I moved from being a, a distant com a commentator on the situation to actually um, use the, my creative tools to engage with the causes I wanted to promote and, um, and support. Next. In 2015, I had just opened a Facebook account and um, in Lebanon, we saw a, a strong or strong, a small <laughs> or big, an uprising that we have called al Hirak, uh, known often outside as the, the trash movement or the youth think movement. And so it was, it, it was it started because of a big uh, problem of um, of uh, trash collection that we had on the streets of Beirut. I started uh, drawing again in my room uh, and writing and posting images and messages on social media. And what happened was the way it happened was that the first night people uh, went to protest the amount of police repression was huge and some videos circulated. And I think for a whole big amount of people, it was a shock to see that actually suddenly the state could be so strong and so repressive. It was almost as if we were unaware because we had this illusion that this was a weak, absent, incompetent uh, entity. And after these videos circulation circulated, you know, against a few protesters, then you know, a mass movement happened. Uh, thousands of people went down uh, and took the street. So this is one of my imagery. It says, uh, "What do you mean? There is no state. There is a state, and it looks like this." Also inspired from a common uh, sentence that we repeat. There is no state, Mafidaule. Next, please. These are the two. So this is what this is the same poster on the right, and on the left um, to the security forces. Uh, defend them and go back to your houses without water and without uh, electricity. So, so the my problematic was, you know, how come there are such a how come suddenly the state is so strong at the moment of 
um, of oppressing uh, protesters. Next, please. These are two other visuals about fear. Um, the the building of the walls, the 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 barbed wire and the fences, and the amount of security present. I inverted, you know, the question by saying, you know, who is scared of of its own people? Next. And this one was celebrating a feeling that um, also came out of this uh, protest, which is um, some form of belonging, some idea that when we all gathered on the streets, we realized there was a form of community. There was an us. A friend of mine wrote this on Facebook, and I found it a very interesting um, a, a very true way to express the feeling. So we are the owners of uh, the seashore because the seashore in Beirut and all over Lebanon has been sold. So owner is also Ashab, friends and the owner. We are the middle, we are, Nahna Balad, we are the middle of the country, we are the heart of the country, etc. It's a series. Uh, next, please. Okay, in 2019, um, on day two of the second big wave of uh, Lebanese uprising, so the 2019 was obviously much bigger than 2015, uh, uh, I had started during that year with around 10 uh, people, a kind of think tank about the relation between different artistic disciplines and, uh, and politics. And this group of people decided in 2019 on the second day of the uprising to, to create a form of uh, an initiative that started online on Instagram and that combined answers to the questions we had been discussing across the year. They are basically what we produced were um, visuals that would accompany uh, the uprising, but also critical questions and uh, direct actions. So we worked almost uh, every day and we were trying to constantly be um, answering whatever was happening. We were also obviously on the street. Some of our work was coming from what was happening and some of our work was uh, adding to what was happening. So the, the image of the kids is, is one of us who started a little neighborhood initiative. Um, the, uh, the, the, the yellow uh, post was an answer to um, Hassan Nasrallah's speech about a, a void, the danger of a void. So we would be constantly in dialogue with uh, what was happening on the street. Next. So, sorry, so this project is called Bin Mersal. Uh, the page on Instagram is called uh, Bin Mersal. And I just wanted to add, I don't know if I put any example, but we also um, collaborated with uh, political groups, with lawyers, with journalists, with a whole bunch of people to add to our knowledge and efforts um, sometimes we would uh, simplify complex information into accessible uh, data and graphics. And so this was also a role we decided to take on. <clears throat> Next. This is one example of um, the way our um, visuals would also have a life on the street. Sometimes they would be negotiated. So um, uh, erased or sprayed on. Uh, sometimes we would find them in other cities where people just printed them and posted them. Sometimes we would actually distribute our posters and at the moment of exchange have a discussion with people around us if they would want to carry this message and whatever opinion they had about them, etc. <coughs> Next, please. <coughs> Sorry. This is one uh, example on 
um, Independence Day, we created, uh, we were inspired by a, um, a, co a collective who in 2015 did an incredible video about the idea of the independence. Uh, and we used their format to let people fill in what would they want independent from what. So it is, if you want a fill in poster, um, independence, in the, uh, we want the independent of blank from blank and people would fill it in either digitally or um, by hand. So we printed a lot of them and we went to the street and then we distributed them and people would just fill in and carry or paste. And this was an interesting way for us to somehow create messages together as opposed to disseminate our own. Um, and here to conclude on my second question about uh, design and politics, I think Bil Mirsad was one of the uh, most complete uh, answer to that question in the sense that um, it allowed us or what we've reached through this experience was not only to re-question the function of graphic design as a field in relation to society, but also the, the process of how do we communicate publicly when we have the privilege and the responsibility to be able to disseminate in mass graphics and visuals and messages, how do we do it? And until today, the only formats that we know are the ones that have been developed for the market. And it has been a challenge to really rethink how else do we create public uh, content? Uh, what we had reached is also that every, so as a group working in Bel and um, and in, in the lab that we started before, was to constantly link our messages with actions, to never actually promote ideas that we cannot back with actions, to never work the way branding does, which is to sell values that you can't explicitly uh, or you can't um, materially um, uh, assess. So, um, so our, our bodies on the street and our um, verbal communication and the possibility for our audiences to answer back and contest and exchange and negotiate was for us a way to re-question what does it mean to communicate? What, does it, what do the politics of our communication mean? What does it mean when we are not just adopting strategies developed for the market and just changing content into politics. How else do we do this? Next. Okay, so the third question I had been struggling with, which was the language of my images. Um, I started with this question through drawing and not through graphic design. This is the example of um, uh, illustr uh, commissioned for a um, uh, book of Palestinian folk tales called Uliater. Uh, uh, I think sp speak, bird speak, or something like this in English. And this is a rule, an ogress. Um, and for this book, it, it was extremely long and complex uh, process for me to do these illustrations. It was uh, almost like a manifestation of an identity crisis into a commission project. I did a lot of, of research, but eventually what I realized is that through illustrations in my own history and in my own visual culture of illustration, I had uh, the language, I was able to paint in Arabic to say it like it I don't know how, I didn't know how to do this as a graphic designer, but I knew how to do this as an illustrator. I didn't have the distance or the words to, to point at what it meant, which I can actually do now in this talk. But at the time, it was a very intuitive 
uh, a process. Um, so I think I discovered mainly two things in painting in Arabic. I'm happy to use etel, so I don't, you know, make a strange statement. Um, one was this mix between creating figurative imagery that suddenly flatten into ornament. And it was an extremely enjoyable process for me to spend hours dotting and coloring and, and flattening something that is not 3D and perspective. And I think in this, um, in this mix between you know, the 2D and the 3D, the ornamental and the purely figurative, there was a, a language that I could recognize that I had seen before. Next, please. And the second aspect, obviously key in any illustration work, but that I had to teach myself was um, the play on composition and how, how do we use a negative space, white space, where do we create you know, imagery, not only in, in the ink on the paper, but also in the absence of ink on paper. And all of these were part of a visual culture that I received intuitively, but I needed to reteach myself. Um, and this project was a key moment for it. Next, please. And here also you can see a very figurative representation of a uh, pomegranate, but only at the intersection between the two cut parts, suddenly it almost becomes like a flat pattern. And, and the playfulness between, you know, flattening and, you know, and rendering that is extremely, you know, um, correct in terms of lighting, was a was a was for me a almost a bridge between also two languages and two cultures. Next, please. In 2019, I was commissioned to um, illustrate uh, the medieval tales of an Iraqi judge, Tanuhi, and the same dilemma happened again. Um, in this case, what I tried to do was to find tools the tools I would hold in my hand that could say something about the origin of these images. Next, please. And I was inspired by the Sudanese illustrator, Hassan Moussa, who uses the calligraphic pen and does drawing that look like calligraphic texts, which is not my case, but I also use the calligraphic pen as a, sorry, as a tool that would link between <clears throat> writing and imagery, but also, Arabic calligraphy and Arabic drawings, if you want. Next, please. This one, I think, is a better example where you can see the traces of the, of the pen. Next, please. And this one also where the thickness of the pen creates almost two cities, one in black and one in white. And so, you know, there's a space to play between positive and uh, negative imagery. So, <clears throat> so these questions about where my images belong to, I first struggled with uh, into my illustration work, but it also, this question was also very present into, um, into design work. And next please. And the reason why um, I had some kind of control about the, I'm gonna keep on calling it the visual language of my design was because all the raw material of the design work I could produce. So I, I trace the lettering. I don't only use typefaces and I draw the imagery. I don't only, you know, um, or direct other people or, or or get imagery and because i can write and draw or you know letter and draw it gave me a lot of space to actually create the vocabulary through which you know i can i could uh, i could speak that language 
So <clears throat> this is a series of posters, first for uh, music. Um, <clears throat> Mayel is an ensemble of uh, Arabic classical music. On the left, I used historical imagery, but on the right, again, I used, you know, the qalam, the nib pen, as a um, way to create rhythm and proportion, something that could be um, um, an intersection between calligraphy and music, but also is abstract and also says somehow Arabic language, right? <clears throat> Next, please. Another example for Mayal, and I think these two examples are um, now that I look at it with, you know, almost 10 years later, I think they are uh, failed answers <laughs> to, to my questions. Uh, here I borrowed an Islamic pattern and, um, and, you, and I can see a struggle. <laughs> I can see how I need the vocabulary that says this belongs there and I didn't know how to find it. So either I would draw or I would borrow or I would, but, you know, I didn't know exactly. I think there was one element missing and I'm discovering this as I speak now that I will talk about later. <clears throat> okay, next. This is for another ensemble of uh, Arabic classical music, Asil. And here the, the logo has been, um, is the work of, uh, of uh, calligrapher Samir Sayer. And because of how strong the calligraphy is, it somehow imposed itself on um, uh, the posters I was about to design. On the right, I used uh, exercise uh, that we do when we learn uh, Arabic calligraphy. And again, it was a way to create, to use the dots as an equivalent to music, etc. The composition is tries to create some form of imbalance. There's constantly a, an attempt to play with the positive and the negative. But I think on the left was the beginning of an answer, which was one aspect was missing to my design. It's true, I could have the raw material. I could have Arabic language and Arabic calligraphy, and I could have imagery that I could control. I think what I missed was layout. I didn't have um, the tools of what, what layout of the history of design in this region would look like. And this was the first attempt on the left for, uh, for, this, for the Burda, for the poem of the Burda. Next, please. <clears throat> this is for. The performance O to end. And here also, um, again, this is an example of my, you know, my use of, you know, here it's lettering that became um, imagery in itself. So again, I keep on having this, I keep on having the freedom to use um, elements of my designs that, that say very clearly what language they speak, if you want. <laughs> Next. For O2 Ends, which was a event uh, comprised of mainly a performance, but also arti artistic interventions and workshops, uh, talks, etc. I did a, uh, an installation using the text of the play. The event is based on a place of Samuel Beckett translated to, to Arabic. And I created this big role across the space of the, the installation. Next, please. Another work for a, uh, it's a double poster for performance and artistic in, installation, the unfinished work of uh, works of Kevart Casarian. And I think also here, these are good examples of having the raw material but not having the layout, struggling with the layout that had a particular um, language. Next, please. These were some of the uh, social media posts uh, using different elements of the performance and art artistic installation. 
videos, uh, uh, archival imagery, and um, and the drawing. <clears throat> okay, next. So Dawawin is a cultural center that opened in Beirut in 2012, for which I designed the identity. And here I will only show some of the publications um, layout that I uh, worked on. Uh, these are publications for different film cycles that were uh, happening at Dawawin. And um, yeah, I also think this is an example of a struggle that doesn't totally reach. But basically what happened was some of the publications were bilingual and some had um, each language alone. Here, what was interesting for me is that <clears throat> the content of this publication was not in any way linked to the Arab world or the Arab region. Several of the films you know, were coming from all over the world, from South America, from uh, Europe, etc. But sometimes the language was Arabic, right? So I was not helped by, um, by, by the cultural color of the content itself, only by the language. And um, next, please. <clears throat> and I tried to create a series of layouts that had a form of homogeneous grid, but also constant flexibility. Every spread would be a... Um, uh, presentation of a film. So this is Said Nova in the English, uh, sorry, in the French publication, next. And this would be the one in Arabic. And, you know, you can see there's a struggle. There's an attempt that doesn't totally reach. What, it, what I did though, is that I liberated myself from some of the norms I had uh, been applying in publication design in regards to the amount of typefaces, to the rigidity of grids, to constantly creating a parallel between two languages, etc. What I think I did not reach was actually finding a full language that, um, that I could inscribe in both the historic and geographic context. Next. So here you can see the two languages in front of one another where they also echo the image. So the image has a duality and the two pages uh, also. <clears throat> Next. Okay, so I'm coming to a form of conclusion. The last three projects are, I will present are, uh, <clears throat> we could say three of my, um, well, I have four, let's say, I have four very complete projects that really answer in many aspects um, my work. I will only show three of them. One of them is a Slubar Beirut a Publishing House, which uh, these are some of the books. The second is um, the magazine Bidayat. The third is the book, uh, no, you can stay on the other, yeah. The third is the book, uh, the Book of Margins, Kitab al and the fourth is Sigil, an artistic collective I have co-founded, but I will not talk about Sigil now just for the purpose of uh, finishing on time. So, <clears throat> so this is Nubad Beirut. Nubad Beirut is a small publishing house that started in 2013, I think. Uh, we mainly, I have now joined the publishing house. I started as a commission designer. We work um, either on Arabic books or on translated books to Arabic. The subjects of interest, a lot of them have to do with history, some with linguistics. Um, <clears throat> here you have examples of uh, a 19th century revival of a book on nudity. <clears throat> you have a series of, um, so these are the Samuel Beckett books translated to Arabic. Next, please. So this is the, the, the Beckett series. Um, again, here I have uh, devised both the typography uh, of this emblem of Samuel Beckett, very difficult to read on top, and the illustrations of the cover on top of, of the designs, of course. The idea behind 
the series is a um, is a very uh, experimental proposition from the um, uh, publishing house because we publish in in classical Arabic, but also sometimes parts of the book are in uh, Lebanese <clears throat> dialect, not as a form of a national reclaim, but as a almost as a um, as a linguistic solution to a problem of orality, typically. Uh, um, you know, uh, theater has always this issue where speaking in, if you were to publish theater in Arabic and classical Arabic, when you have to recite it, it is uh, disconnected from the way we usually speak. And <clears throat> the translator of Samuel Beckett uh, books found that the texts of Beckett that almost sound like a voice in our head only make sense if they sound like we speak. And so uh, Snubar Beirut has devised particular letters for some of the sounds of uh, Lebanese dialect, which meant that we also worked with typographers to have these letters within the Arabic fonts that we used uh, in the text. Um, <clears throat> also, the design of the Samuel Beckett emblem is almost illegible because I wanted it to be as difficult as his text, as obscure, difficult, no, as um, as challenging to access, if you want, as the text of, of Beckett. Another aspect of this series are these uh, stains on the back covers. So um, across the identity of Snubar Beirut, which is based on the idea of an ink stain, there is always a play between the unique and the mass produced again. The idea of having a printed stain on the back cover of a book fools you, not knowing if this is your own copy that is stained or you know if it's repeated. So this is this was one of our our little games <laughs> as a publishing house. Next, please. A second book I will talk about. We have until today around only twelve published books. This was also one of the first uh, books we worked on, Rasul al hadi So these are um, uh, translated texts, sorry, uh, texts about uh, nudity that were uh, published in the beginning of last century and that we uh, republished. The statement um, so, so these are the work of Fuad Ahbej, and the statement behind such a work was also somehow a political statement. Uh, in the use of imagery, we decided not to focus as much on nudity because of the statement of nudity as a normal state of being, as opposed to, you know, um, um, a fascinating. Uh, behavior. So we used some of the positions, some of the original images and created some patterns with them. This is the work of Hussein Nasreddin. You can see one example here. Next one. And these are the patterns. Also within these patterns, there's a glitch. So if you notice it, you can see there's always a mistake at every pattern. Also as a way to play between, you know, the original and the, the mass produced. Next. Second project and before last is Bidayat. So Bidayat is a quarterly pan-Arab magazine. We started in 2012 uh, in reaction and, and celebration of the, the Arab uh, revolutions. Next, please. We uh, we distribute all over the Arab world, and we have sections on uh, politics, um, music, arts, uh, economics, history, etc. And every issue has a particular uh, dossier, but a particular event. What Bidayat tries to do is a um, so first it started by accompanying the, these revolutions, giving a voice to a lot of the youth that who were writing at the time, bloggers from across the world, but also bridging with an older generation 
who had been walking the streets of the same cities in the 60s and 70s. Um, and until today, it has a very uh, strong political place, which is um, the fact that at least it's very clear in Lebanon and similar in, in, in various degrees across the Arab world, a lot of the critical writing that is produced from the region or about the region today very often happens in foreign languages, uh, mainly because of you know, the strength of private foreign academia and, and funding, and, and it often addresses audiences outside of the region. It always explains us to the rest of the world and to the centers of knowledge production. And what we try to do is to actually uh, not counter this, but, you know, walk our own path, produce content that is not concerned with rectifying our image or answering the stereotypes that we have been assigned or defending our cultural specificity. It is totally not concerned with this. It's, it tries to actually uh, really uh, answer the questions and concerns of, you know, um, of the Arab region. May a lot, ideally, and we try and struggle from Arab writers to, to Arab readers. Uh, next, please. So in terms of the design, um, I also struggled somehow because I think it started somehow nostalgic. And for the past now, uh, two years, the, the, the team has expanded and I think the design is, is now moving away from uh, what it was, but it started as a reference to these um, similar uh, publications in the 60s and 70s. So there's a lot of, you know, the typeface is very close to the one of letterpress. There's a lot of play with ink and manual work and, um, also, there are uh, features uh, inspired from uh, manuscripts and, you know, and there's the kind of color and the kind of paper somehow is a little bit nostalgic. And this is, you know, my own self critique about the work and little by little, we are moving into something that is a bit more contemporary. Next, please. This is one example of a calligraphic title for a dossier on, on Syria. Next. These are opening section uh, pages where the content of the section is uh, mirrored into the, the collages of the, the opening pages. Next. This one for me is an interesting example because it is an infographic uh, using collage and it tries to challenge the usual language of infographics that are very, um, um, that use uh, almost universal iconography and tries to always look extremely scientific and clean and geometric. And here it's, it's a bit rough and messy and uh, it uses um, old etching mainly. Next. Another insight page where on the left, the layout is inspired by manuscripts where uh, the separation between sentences doesn't use the norm of a space, but here uses dots to separate. <clears throat> Next. Here, it's also an example of how text and image are in dialogue sometimes. So the three columns present, they al it almost looks like one uh, imagery. Next. No, I'm oh, sorry, yeah. And this is one example where you can see the use of the Kashida, the extended um, links between letters in our pull-out code. So these are all, we are not, of course, new doing, doing these experiments. I mean, a lot of um, uh, the influence, a lot of the schools that influenced our work uh, include, for example, 
uh, Iranian contemporary design, looking back also at uh, historic publications. And Yir Bidayat is the beginning of an example in relation to the posters I showed before, where publication design also tries to link, to inscribe itself historically in a lineage, and not only the elements through which the designs are made. Okay, next and final project. So this has been, so I started with my worst project ever, and I will end with my favorite project ever. <laughs> so this is Kitab al-Hawamish, the Book of Margin. So this book is a commission originally. Um, the Cultural Center, Dar and Nimr, opened in Beirut in 2017. And for its opening exhibition, it, a, um, which was the display of the collection uh, of Rami Nimr, the owner and founder of the Dar. The um, uh, exhibition called Midad had a whole range of different kinds of artifacts around calligraphy and writing and books, from tools to manuscripts to the beginning of printing. And the curator of the exhibition asked from six uh, artists, contemporary artists, to produce artwork uh, reacting to this uh, collection. So it was a, a fascinating um, process because we had access to extremely rare material and because the project took time we had access for almost a year at the beginning with even the possibility to physically turn pages and then you know digitally look at the archives and I spent a lot of time looking at mainly books um, but also all forms of uh, documents and something was a revelation for me which was how rich visually and how rich um, functionally were books in relation to what they are today. So I suddenly felt a huge frustration towards the kind of design that I have been taught and I have been teaching, which is mainly the European modernist understanding fun of functional practical book design in relation to a whole history of an, an artistic practice, the one of bookmaking, that I found totally lost. And that also I found uh, I had never had access to. So because I was the only designer amongst these artists, I decided to make a book. This was the display of the book. It was printed in a thousand copies and 30 at a time uh, would be on this stand displayed as you see and then people were able if they wanted to take uh, copies and and this particular aspect was also a statement I wanted to make again in my dichotomy as an artist designer which was in the middle of this exhibition of super rare and precious books I would produce you know in mass and free access uh, publication. Next, please. This is the display of the book at the Victoria and Albert Museum. This book has been nominated for the Jamil Prize uh, this year for the sixth edition. So this was the second uh, display. The first one was the display at Dar and Emmer. So here you can see some uh, printed pages of the book. Next, please some insight pages next okay so the book is divided into uh, three chapters the middle chapter talks of uh, so it looks at the margins the physical margin as a main feature of old books but also the idea of the marginal everything around the book practice so the middle uh, space of the book is chapter one in the black frame and the blue frame is chapter two. Uh, the chapter one talks about everything around the letters. It means the, the teshkil, the vowels, but also the dotting, but also pronunciation of letters, anatomy of letters, etc. Uh, here it is a um, 
a mapping of um, the vocabulary of typography and calligraphy, where the names of letter parts link to body parts. So I associate them on the left page. On the right page, for example, I made a link between uh, some um, diacritics and letters. So Hamzit al Wasl, Shadde, and Hamza. If you add to them a stomach, a button, they become Saad and Sin and Ain. For those who understand Arabic. Um, next, please. Again, there there is a study on or a, a parallel between different kinds of anatomical um, uh, parts, so body parts and uh, letter parts, the Ain uh, of the Fa of the and the Qaf. The discovery for me that fa and kaf don't always have one on, and two dots. In uh, the Maghrib, they sometimes have a dot under and a dot above. So these are part of the you know the research I did and uh, exhibited in this book. In the second frame, in the second chapter in blue, you have excerpts of uh, guides for scribe written in the 10th century. And it talks about recipes for colored ink, for gold, for uh, glue, binding, etc. Next, please. Some of the pages talk about the pronunciation. So this is what's around letters and, and books. And where do letters belong? At what place of our throat or mouth? Next. The illustrations are um, antique uh, engravings, so they are not uh, mine, just to make sure you... So I'm only responsible. Here. So here, it's almost the opposite here. The content is not mine. The type is not, the, the text is not, the illustrations are not. But here, it's a real experiment in layout inspired by uh, manuscripts and, uh, and um, old printed books. Here it's a linguistic play between the idea of the fatha and the kasra as two diacritic one where their name talks about the way we open and close our mouth. Next, please. One of the recipes for red ink includes pomegranate and it's a parallel between you know, chapter one and chapter two. Next. Among the discoveries one was the idea that ink wells need to be round. So this was in the Amdat um, al-Kutab, the guide for scribes, so that ink doesn't gather in the corner of um, the recipient. So this is also a graphic interpretation of the tools of, um, of calligraphy and writing on books. Also in the bottom left corner of the pages is the catchword. So the catchword is an ancient practice we don't use in books anymore. It used to replace what today uh, function as page numbers. So basically uh, every page would have on the bottom left corner, the first word of the next page. Its original function was to be able to then collate the page together. But in some pages you find them in the recto and verso and eventually it is because um, during the uh, oral recitation, uh, including the tajweed of the Quran, to make sure one doesn't interrupt the rhythm while turning the page, this was an aid for the continuity of reading. This is also a feature that is uh, lost today. Next. So the third chapter is, the book has three chapters. One is around the letter, second around the book, and the third marginal element was a scar. So I found a scar on a page of the Quran, and then I discovered there's a whole practice around scars. Uh, in parch so the third chapter is about parchment making. In parchment making, uh, often uh, the um, animal skin, the animal could be wounded, the skin could tear and it creates certain scars. There's a whole art of stitching these scars. And I found this fascinating and used this marginal element as a excuse to 
understand more about parchment making as a practice. My main question was, you know, how many animals do you need to slaughter to make a book? And, you know, I, want, I wanted to understand more about this practice. Next, please. I used illustrations from a uh, war surgery uh, manual to talk about, you know, this link between body and, and uh, book. Next, please. And I discovered, among other things, um, the origin of the A4 uh, proportion. Until today, papers, uh, paper manufacturers use only two standards, A and B, and they both have more or less the same rectangular proportions, which apparently come from parchment making, which is basically the belly of the animal, which had more or less these proportion. So these are part of the, if you want, historic anecdotes that I discovered um, through the research of, um, of book production in this project. Uh, and this project for me is somehow uh, the most complete representation of the three questions I addressed in my work. Um, somehow, it has, it's between an artistic and design product. Um, also, it has a very strong political statement in relation to uh, a graphic design uh, legacy that I want to celebrate, and also a history that has been totally marginalized uh, with the advent of Western print production, the history of you know, a whole part of Arabic design, a practice of the region. And I think so, I think this is the most comprehensive work in relation to these uh, three questions I, I talked about in my work. And I will end here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jana. <laughs> this was really comprehensive. The fact that you started with the three questions actually kind of prompted a lot of conversations uh, and also bringing in through a lot of these examples through your work, I think uh, raised a lot of questions, at least for me. Um, I mean, one of the major questions, which maybe we can go back to, but I would love to raise at some point, which is basically what you pointed out with regards to finding alternative ways to determine relationships with humans or lifestyles that counter a consumerist relationship. I think we can go back to this. Let's open now the questions so we can, uh, with those who are participating, if they have any questions. Um, so if anyone has any questions, they can either raise their hands or just kind of place it, write it in the chat, or else I can continue asking my questions to Jana. So let's go for it, Jana. Maybe we'll give them some time. Um, so, I mean, that was a really intriguing kind of point of investigation to do that via you know, graphic design, but also the relationship between graphic design and art in which, as you said, rightfully in the beginning, that graphic design is prompted by, you know, uh, by a consumer, you know, by someone needs something, we need to create something for that. And I'm wondering what kind of solutions or resolutions did you get to with regards to what kind of relationships, alternative relationships we can create beyond consumerism? Um, okay, I don't, I don't think we have the power to challenge the system to the extent of, I mean, I think design is, a, is um, design has not always been a tool of uh, consumerism, right? It, it is not the case. It is one part of its history that has been totally hijacked and put at the service of, um, 
of selling and consuming and but and and i think challenging this doesn't mean we can make the system, that system mm-hmm. fall what it only means is that um or at least for me i was trying to find other examples of who had been using the same tools and creativity for other purposes mm-hmm. so one example was for example a um, gerard paris clavel the ne papier collective etc but also how do we re question this not only by doing different designs for same or or, or same design for other purposes if you want mm-hmm. um typically in lebanon recently we have a history of political campaigns that work with ad agencies so it's just you know you just replace a product by a person by ideas but and it's you just use exactly the same things but there is an opportunity to re-question how do we communicate and um and the work that we have done in bil mersad in 2019 was i think a good example of because it was an interdisciplinary group we were people from very different practices and not only designers and it was at the at the key moment uh, uh, politically so there was an urgency to actually produce and communicate and exchange um so uh, the way we sorry i have a little baby here <laughs> so the so the way we we managed to do this was um almost coming back to the basics uh, um, if communication is exchanged then it cannot be monologue if communication demands um a presence it cannot just be posted right mm-hmm. so it cannot be that we spread messages and we are unrelated to the process of mm-hmm. their dissemination it cannot be that our mm. bodies are not at the moment of this encounter with the audience it, it it's it's a whole set of um um of ways to re-question the the essence of what it means to communicate and not consider that you just have deliverables and you fill them with different content um mm. So distributing things on the street, filling in the content of posters together, um, uh, mixing, uh, uh, breaking the boundaries of discipline where sometimes we did almost performative events where our presence on the street, I mean, we had an incredible moment. This It, it also worked because everyone was every day on the street, obviously, but but it was a good experiment to see that there's other ways to communicate when our goals are different and we cannot just and i don't think we totally succeeded in many ways the language we used reproduced exactly what you we knew how to do i mean it was really an experimental um mm. initiative in some places we just looked like any other thing we did that you could fill with any content but in other instances we found you know moments that re questioned what it means to communicate among members of a society. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, we talked at some point about this idea of kind of being a chameleon, so kind of changing or responding to a moment very quickly and, and kind of acquiring a language that would respond to that moment, regardless how, where, but like continuously being able to respond and create, you know, like networks of production uh, that would respond to that moment. So it's not just a singular response, but it's more of a collective response. Uh, And I would like to, for you to kind of speak a little bit because you have so much of that in the range of work you showed us in terms of how you are able, whether Uh, within a collective, with a group of people to continuously be able to respond to these moments by producing these channels, these these, uh, production uh, channels that are able to recreate uh, things over and over again by 
changing always. And I think that is might be an interesting learning process for us and others who are participating in this talk. Are you talking mainly about so work like Wilmer said or like a clearly um, work that was part of political movements or are you talking about other kind of um, I think I think in general, you know, like Bill Marsal, but also like even Kitab al Hawamish, with you kind of re-questioning, because we also spoke about the different schools of design, the Iranian school versus the Western school, like also kind of reconsidering these things continuously and responding to these changes and finding finding production uh, channels collectively to reiterate that but differently i think that mode of change like being a shapeshifter really works uh you said an imposter syndrome i say a shapeshifter as well mm. i think that <clears throat> at the beginning of my talk i said i'll talk about the relation between form content and context and eventually i never use these three words but i think they are key these are the three um, uh, elements that that I mean that we all juggle with if we work in this field, but in this case, also it it links back to your first question. But there's, for example, uh, I talked about a different relation with an audience, but there's also a different relation with the person who commissions you or the person producing content, right? I mean, there's a very um, uh, a, a common understanding in design, which is there's a designer in face of a client. And often, you know, if you look at, you know, design pages, memes on Instagram, it's all mocking the client's input on our design or the designer's reaction to it. And I think it's one of the most terrible relations when it's established as such, because, um, yeah, I mean, so for example, in in most of the work that I that I've done, it's there are more collaborations than they are actually um, exchange of services. Also, because so if, when I I worked for Asebil, I'm, I'm a member. When I work for Snubal Beirut or or Bidayat, I'm I am part of the team. I get involved in content. I have something to say. I. I become a member of, you know, I attend editorial meetings. There's no disconnection between, um, I can have a say on content because, because the reason why me and other people are collaborating is because we find, uh, you know, uh, a whole array of interest in common from linguistic to typography to, and, and I think this is part of the way I mean, I stand against the idea of the, you know, client designer relation more. And, and I, I am for a relation of collaboration where there's a, a trust and an interest in making this project ours. And maybe this is, um, I mean, this is part of what is collective. I don't, I'm, I don't work with a one large collective. I have many different collaborations. I mean, in this talk, I wasn't able to name the amount of people who are, of course, involved with me on all of these projects, because uh, it sounds like I work alone, but there's always, you know, there's always teams and people and, and on different ends of the, you know, of the commission when it's a commission. Um, also, for example, with Sigil that I didn't have time to talk about Sigil, but we we formed a small collective we are four um, architects artists designer and also we collaborated with several groups to do the work that we did as you know with an artistic uh, um, you know opportunities and so i think design gives us this this chance that because your content could be anything then you there's so much possibility to collaborate with so many different people I think what is key is is the kind of relations and the way these exchanges happen or or this collective production happens. 
Um, uh, there's a question uh, that Dima has raised. Uh, she says, thanks, Jana. I've noticed with calligraphers and graphic designers, there is a practice in turning type into logos and calligraphy into artistic units while leaving behind the aesthetics and values of scribes and the process of bookmaking and the, and the meaning a paragraph or classic poetry verse form is perceived as a whole. I'd like to understand what made that shift from calligraphy as an informative tool to an artistic aesthetic form excluded from the meaning of the words and the letters it carries. For, um... Okay, thanks. <laughs> for I, I don't know if I have the knowledge to answer this question, but there's one thing I know for sure is that if you are talking about this very common logo format where Arabic is a beautiful visual composition that seems like it's translated under with Latin type, I think this is exactly one of the examples of our, um, our disconnection from a, a design of our region where we where we we were faced with two kind of um, attitudes towards uh, design. One of them was we will do design that look exactly like you know uh, the legacy of Western modernist design, and so us, the Arab world, we can do good design and good design looks like this. We have the capacity and we'll speak the same voice as you. And we, you know, it looks as professional and as clean and, you know, and since it looks like you, it is good design. And another one has been, we will reclaim what belongs to us, which is more of a reactionary attitude. And by reclaiming it, we will get the value in your eyes because we are different and because there's some kind of, um, richness to our culture that you do not have and so and then there's almost like a self exoticizing attitude and in this process uh, our, our um, uh, if you want calligraphy among so calligraphy becomes key because it just says Arabic it doesn't need to be content it doesn't need to be read it, does, it is just we need a sign to say we, we are not you, we are different, and this is how it is. I think that, that, that this phase has evolved. I think a lot of designers in the region work, uh, I mean, there's a boom in Arabic typography. There's, a, there's, you know, we are a big range of Arab designers who have been asking these similar questions and have been providing, you know, so many different answers. But, but there is still an unsolved problem. These two attitudes still exist. And the example of the you know, calligraphy as ornamental and, and Latin as legible is a very, it's a really interesting example because it, you can see that this is the beginning of an attitude. Today, we have evolved from it, but really a moment where we don't really know how to say we belong from here. So we just need to, we just need the signs for them. We don't need the content. We don't have, we don't speak our language. We just sound our language, if you want. We just sound like it. Um, I think the parallel with language is very useful to explain what we do. We just put a sign that says, this belongs here, that's it. And um, yeah, but I think this has evolved, thankfully. <laughs> I mean, you you point out, you kind of put drawing, I think, is there someone who wants to ask a question? Let's see. Ah, yeah, I think Zena has Zena. A... Go for it, Zena. I can't see the rest of the participants, by the way. I don't know how to do this now, but I can only see. They don't have their video. <laughs> It's true, only now you. That I Hi, Zena. Mind, I need to, need to beautify myself. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks, Jenna, for this beautiful sort of... Uh, uh, survey, retrospective self-reflection. And um, I wanted to comment on the, the autonomy that you expressed feeling in how you can adapt your, uh, apply your skills from uh, design to art to illustration and how this allowed you to have a voice um, and uh, use, use, use it and, and have a voice and use it. And um, 
as you're talking about this dichotomy or the split between Arabic and, and Western or like this kind of gap, I'm struck by the uh, how to bring in, is it possible to bring in a recognition of the Muslim world as a source of creativity that is ongoing and vibrant because a lot of what was referred to does belong to Muslim culture. And I understand the evolution of having to separate Arabic from Muslim in the modern um, context and specifically in the Lebanese context. But I think maybe it's a chance to um, approach it differently, uh, especially when I heard your, uh, your reaction to the, the Mimir collection and the discovery of you know hundreds and hundreds of uh, uh, thousands of years of well, I mean paper making books were began in, in the 11th century and it was a democratizing process. Everyone could read books and make books. It was not uh, the way it might have been in other contexts and other cultures. So in this in the spirit of being. Continue, connected to the history of the of the region that we belong to. Um, I wonder if, I mean, like even the Burda, a lot of, I don't know how to, to bring these worlds together because I feel there's such a wealth and, but also there's so much stereotype and misinformation and, um, you know, ugliness that's often associated with Muslim. And so it's actively avoided. So I'm just wondering if you've had any thoughts around that. Uh, good. Thanks, Zena. It's funny, actually, because I think what happens is the opposite, but this is uh, an interesting debate to have. I, I, you only made me realize now that I never, in, in this whole talk, and when I talk about the work, it's true, I never actually um, uh, point at what we could call, you know, uh, uh, the Muslim world or a legacy. The reason why is very much linked to a, um, a reaction I did to exactly to this. I mean, academically, the reason why as a graphic designer, I've never had any access to a lot of this work is exactly because it is under uh, Islamic studies. And this is how a lot of, you know, mainly American academia has divided um, the interest into these artifacts. And it's in reaction. So for me, it's the opposite of what you say. What I understand is that the dominant understanding is there is a category called Islamic art that is under Islamic rule, right? Artifacts produced under Islamic, uh, in moments under Islamic uh, governance or rule. And this is how they are studied across the world. And this is how, this is the filter through which they are looked at. And what I'm doing for me was a reaction to this was to, to say first, I'm an angry graphic designer because I, I need this to have belonged to also graphic design history and not only Islamic art history. And there's a problem here. There's a, there's a political problem here. And second, because um, I, I didn't wear these glasses to look at these artifacts, it was, it was not irrelevant, but it was only one filter through which I can read the connection between these things. But I've been looking at work that were, you know, I don't know, at profane work, at Bibles, at, you know, at almost like flyers, you know, and things that, um, so maybe, so maybe what you pointed that I missed is actually my own reactionary attitude to, you know, a, um, a dominant discourse in the centers of knowledge production that for me has totally hijacked our voice. It has labeled and named and categorized and also essentialized identities and works that were produced in particular moments and in particular contexts because of this problematic relation to the geopolitically uh, about Islam. So um, it's almost as if each is a reaction to, 
to something and yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to add that um, this feeling of being angry, like where is all this? Why isn't it there in the graphic design field? Or it, this actually exists in every single field that is out there. Every single one from medicine to, to philosophy, to literature, to love poems, to, to anything, to wellness, to anything. In every single field that is out there, somehow the Muslim Arab world is... Uh, systematically ignored and it is part of a of an uh a, like academic um I think the centers of knowledge that emerged in uh Europe in the 12th century from translations in the Arab world but because the Arabs are too close we're too close as neighbors and we're perceived as you know the the other it was always safer to say, okay, Sufi poetry is Persian, Arabic is too close, you know, or, or science is Greek through Arabic translation, but it, the, the, the Arabs always, it's such an old history of being uh, not included or, or minimized or just mentioned in a, in a reductive way. Whereas the fact is the complete opposite and whole fields of knowledge have been produced and written about and commented on and addressed critically from psychology to geology, I mean, you know, uh, not to all of them, all of them. <laughs> um, and they're so systematically not included. It shocks me all the time. So I have this anger as well. Yeah, so I wanted to share that. <laughs> <laughs> but I just wanted to add that um, what I, the exercise I'm trying to do as a designer is also an exercise that I have learned from the way I described in, in the talk what I think Bidayat's political project is, which is to be, to be unconcerned with correcting my identity and my history to, um, to, to the dominant centers who keep on defining me and us and, you know, just, and, and it's a very difficult exercise. It's a very, very difficult exercise, which means which means re-questioning the lingo and the filters through which we see the world and, the, and the, what we take for granted as, as truth about our reality. And remember that all of these, they come from particular places and moments and, and interests and agendas. And, and so in order not to constantly react to this, the only way is just to to be looking elsewhere, to be producing for others and to be concerned with other uh, problems. And, uh, and that's why sometimes in this process, there's lots of, I'm gonna give a, a, very, uh, um, a very basic example. There's a word I didn't say today. Why I didn't say it is, I just realized it now, but it's, sorry. Ah. Uh, one, uh, go on. Okay, I was just going to say there's one way that, that there's one word that is extremely popular today talking about exactly the this this question. It's the idea of the decolonized uh, design. I didn't use it first because I don't have the literature about it. I'm not sure about it. I'm wary about trendy lingo and also probably in the back of my mind, there's a reason why I would rather use all of the definitions of what I stand for or against instead of the shortcuts that suddenly makes it seem like we all understand what we're talking about. But actually, most of the problematic of the decolonization is a constant dialogue with this, you know, with, with, old uh, colonies where we, we're still talking to them and we need them to correct the, and we're not talking with each other and and amongst each other and to each other and so yeah everything that i know about decolonized um about decolonization happens in english and and in europe and in the state and you know and this is not the concerns of so this is one example you know of how this exercise is also not adopting um, these narratives and try to build others and wear other glasses and look through other filters. And, uh, but yeah. I also have a tiny comment. <laughs> 
with regards to what Zena was saying, which is, I think, also kind of having a, a, a counter reactionary uh, discourse is also problematic and kind of conflating, decomplexifying what the Arab world was with all its multiplicity and ethnicity is also problematic. So I think just kind of pointing out that this is Muslim art or not, kind of takes away from the richness and the diversity that existed in the region, uh, uh, which also kind of channeled into a lot of these references as well, uh, which made it so interesting and made it so effective that it kind of found a widespread uh, all across. But that's my comment. <laughs> I think Jumana has her hands raised. So Jumana, you can unmute yourself as well. Yeah. Um, Jana, thank you so much for, for sharing this uh, wide range of, um, of approach to your work and, uh, and just the mere beauty of it as well and the depth in it. Uh, my, um, there are many things I'd love to uh, sit a number of times with you on, but the the one thing I would love to uh, to speak about is is as as you progressed in your presentation, you were first um, I I was seeing a, a Jenna that uh, was speaking through her uh, design, and then uh, there's uh, Jenna the designer with the book uh, with the book work, and there there are there's a clear in my view uh, a clear uh, advocate and um, and then there's a, a refined uh, designer uh, that's going into the details and the depth and the history of of matter and um, and that may uh, be uh, delving into the pleasure of actually uh, design and uh, regardless of of the actual content of let's say a book or um, or an exhibition, or I'm just sort of generalizing, but uh, at what point, or was there any point, or will do you see yourself able to maybe uh, um, allow yourself to at one point say, my status as a designer or myself as a designer has its limitations and I am someone from a region who needs uh, who needs every one of us uh, to uh, to be uh, to be there present in their thoughts in their critique in their um, contributions and sometimes contributing in our professions or through our professions is is not the right or the it's it's definitely not always the only uh, avenue but it's also sometimes not the right avenue uh, and sometimes might uh, tip matters to uh, to to moving away from the actual focus, or sometimes might actually uh, produce results that aren't necessarily what was sought after. So sometimes we get stuck in our professional hat uh, and uh, and passionate hat uh, that we. Um, um, uh, reduce the possibilities if we were to look at ourselves void of that restriction really sometimes. Wow, that's an interesting question, Jumaima. But I, let me see if I understand it. I'm gonna answer and you tell me if this is what you mean. I, I think that the only way I do this probably I don't. <laughs> so the only way I solve this problem is when I'm on board with others who are who have different professions. And so so I think that many of the questions I raise, for example, um, oops, sorry. Okay, uh, I might have a hearing problem. Okay, I'll solve it in a bit. Uh, many of the questions I, I raise have to do with history and politics, right? And And design cannot solve these questions. But because I am only a graphic designer, I'm also illustrator, an artist, a citizen, and I have interests, and, but I'm professionally only this. For me, the way, and I have frustrations, I would love to have other hats. And I, I, I constantly feel I lack, um, I lack a lot of, um, of access to, 
to to other forms of tools and contents and but i think because i am effectively only this the way i solve what you say is by my association with other people is because my projects have by definition when you're a designer there's a collaborative aspect i i collaborate with people who have the tools and answers and they walk with me the same path we're asking the same questions but they do so in in other fields and i i think that maybe the question that you raise unfortunately because today we are all so specialized in our fields it's almost technically impossible for me to to go beyond my role i already find that i play many roles like i'm an educator and an artist and illustrator and designer and i think i'm lacking you know uh, history and political science and sociology but i cannot be all of this so my only and 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 literature i mean i i've been writing for the past few years but because I cannot wear all these hats, my only way is to actually, you know, jump onto other people who are on the same train, but from their fields and their, I can only see that it's through collaborative work that this happens because, yeah, I don't know if I'm answering your question. <laughs> okay. Okay, wait, You're I need to, I have a problem. I have a hearing problem. So just give me one second. Um, yes, I can hear you. I, okay, so I just need to remove the airpods. Can you speak again? Yeah, so Zena comments, community seems to be at the heart of the answer. Uh, and also Dima, I think, I think just like the, the comment that you just had in terms of like collaborative work is a good comment to end, but I'm going to read Dima's uh, comment on her question, which is the origin of my question is that is that encounter I had when a calligrapher was reluctant to use his hand to write the text of an illustrated book and use it instead to illustrate only, saying that he wants to prove that calligraphy can be formed, not necessarily convey kalam or text. Other than that disconnection, it is also this false hierarchy between artists, scribes, and designers. Mm. Um, so, uh, any more last questions before we end with uh, with Jenna? Unfortunately, I mean, it would be great to just go on and on, but it's now eight ten. So, any last questions? Any comments? I think we are okay, <laughs> Jenna. <laughs> I think you're being called away, Jenna. <laughs> <laughs> okay guys thank you so much for participating in this this uh, amazing very critical really interesting uh, uh lecture that jenna just gave us jenna thank you so much you've been amazing thank you uh, with everything with your baby with all this all sorts of things uh, you were there on time and always prompt so thank you again uh please thank you, i mean we're gonna post this online so for those who are unable to do it will they will be able to see it uh, on uh, tashkil's youtube channel uh, also follow tashkil.org we always have amazing talks and lectures so this is uh, also something to kind of see who else we have uh, coming up soon. Again, once again, Jana, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Iba. Thanks a lot, Rumana, Zena, and everyone. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye.